Okay. I am sharing my screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay. Well, it is an honor to speak to all of you. And I will be talking about downy mildews. And you might be asking yourself, what is a downy mildew? Well, when I was a grad student, a downy mildew was a fungus. There was a five kingdom classification system then. And deep down, we knew that downy mildews, which are water molds, were not fungi. They were much more closely related to brown algae. And we knew that, but you know, we didn't want to make waves and somebody had to study them. So we did. Now in a seven kingdom classification system, um, it's much easier, they get their own kingdom. The kingdom chromista, along with diatoms and brown algae. Well, I mean, you're familiar with brown algae. Giant kelp is a brown alga. Diatoms are brown algae. And what everything in this kingdom shares is a life stage called a zoospore. This is a motile cell with two different types of flagella. One is long and whip-like, and the other has little hairs projecting off it and is called a tinseled flagellum. And these, um, everything in this kingdom has chloroplasts surrounded by four membranes, which suggests that everything in this kingdom arose from a symbiosis between two eukaryotes. You will recall that plants, true plants, are derived from a symbiosis of a eukaryote and a photosynthetic bacterium. So that's why these guys get their own kingdom. Now, okay, water molds don't have chloroplasts and that's what caused this confusion of what they were. Um, they're parasites. They are diploid, meaning that they have two copies of each chromosome in their nucleus, like plants and animals. Their cell wall contains cellulose, like plants. They have a very characteristic spore produced sexually. This spore is called an oospore. It's thick-walled, and it's the only state, life stage in this organism that can exist away from the host. Okay, so water molds lived in the ocean as parasites of algae, nematodes, mollusks, and crustaceans. And if they had stayed in the ocean, they would be these weird curiosities that only a few people knew about. However, they moved onto land and they moved into land plants and they became something that we really had to know about. So I'm going to talk about three genera of water molds. The genus Pythium was established by Nathaniel Pringsheim. The genus Cytophthora was established by Anton de Barry. And the genus Paranospora was described by Carl Joseph Corda. Um, I mentioned these guys because they were true natural historians. There was no DNA analysis back then. There weren't even Petri plates. Um, these scientists made minute observations of morphology and behavior of the organisms they studied, like any natural historian. 
So here are pages out of the sketchbook of Anton de Barry. When de Barry started to look at potato blight, potato blight was considered to have been caused by bad air or cold temperatures. And this fuzzy stuff that you saw on rotten potatoes, that occurred by spontaneous generation. So what DeBerry did was to show that if you took a clean potato, put spores of this organism onto it, that potato blight symptoms would appear. Basically, we consider him the father of plant pathology. And this is all good natural history. Okay, so Pythium phytophthora and downy mildews have different lifestyles. And it's important to see the progression of stages here. Pythium is a saprophyte. It lives in the soil and eats dead plant material, though it can also attack living plants. It can survive indefinitely in the soil and it spreads through the movement of water. These motile zoospores are released from Sporangia and they swim away. Phytophthora is considered a hemibiotroph, meaning that it can, <coughs> it can be cultured, it can survive for short periods of time in soil in plant debris, but mostly it is associated with plant tissue. It can produce these motile zoospores, but these sporangia are detachable and they can move around themselves by water or air and germinate directly, just like a big spore. So this is an advance in lifestyle to move larger distances. Now downy mildews are obligate biotrophs. They cannot be cultured even today they have to be in living plants and they have to eat living plant tissue. They can survive in debris, but only as the oospore stage. They produce sporangia, which are detachable and can spread very, very well in air. Okay, I'm just briefly gonna mention Pythium. You will be familiar with it as something that causes root rots and damping off of seedlings in the spring. It lives in the soil. It can live there forever. As if, if it's cool and wet, it can attack young plants, succulent tissue in the spring and kill the seedlings. Now Phytophthora, is the hemibiotroph. And my first example is Phytophthora cinnamomi. This organism probably originated in New Guinea, but no one can be sure. Um, in 1921, people in Australia began to notice that eucalyptus were dying. And they were dying in places with poor drainage. The next year, they noticed Phytophthora cinnamomi in Australia. However, it was only in 1964 that people realized that Phytophthora cinnamomi was in fact causing the dieback on eucalyptus. And so 40 years, meanwhile, have, have gone by. And <coughs> Those were 40 years of intensive development in Australia with lots of road building. And this pathogen spread with the building of roads. It spread in dirt, it spread in gravel, it spread on tools and on vehicle tires. And all I can say is, is that it's kind of lucky that this pathogen doesn't really spread in air and it only spreads very short different distances in water. So really it had to spread in 
soil. Unfortunately, this organism has a very, very wide host range and is reported now on over a thousand species. And when it got into native Australian habitats, none of these plants had ever encountered it before and they were devastated. Newhook and Podger, two researchers, called it the most destructive plant pathogen ever recorded in native vegetation of this or possibly any region. Whoa. Um, <clears throat> well, it's not just Australia's problem. In 1824, people began to report chestnuts dying in low-lying areas with poor drainage. And this, this epidemic of death spread throughout the, um, the East Coast. And in 1932, Phytophthora cinnamomai was isolated from a dying chestnut and people realized that it was causing this chestnut death. The news of this, I think, got a little bit muted because at the same time, starting in about 1910, uh, chestnuts began to be exterminated by chestnut blight, which you have heard of. So uh, it wasn't, <laughs> by top through cinnamoma, it wasn't a problem anymore because the chestnuts were killed by something else. And in the hundred years since, Phytophthora cinnamomai has spread throughout the natural range of chestnut. Now, you're all familiar with the American Chestnut Foundation, and they have spent decades breeding chestnuts that are resistant to chestnut blight. However, it wasn't only until maybe 15 years ago that they began to realize that they had another problem. A colleague of mine agreed to put in a little chestnut grove in South Carolina so that they could evaluate that those plants for resistance to chestnut blight. But it wasn't possible because in a couple of years, the entire grove was killed by Phytophthora cinnamomai. So this is going to be a new challenge for chestnuts. And this organism is also present on the West Coast and it is causing damage to native Californian habitats. So we have this problem too now. Okay, perhaps the most famous of the water moles is the one that causes potato blight. Potatoes evolved in the Andes. They were introduced to Spain in 1570 and somewhat later in Britain. The original Andean potatoes were genetically diverse. This is very important. They are all different colors, all different sizes. They grew in different habitats. But when they were brought to Europe, they were no longer genetically diverse. The Europeans cultivated the biggest and sweetest ones. Now, Phytophthora infestans evolved in Mexico, probably. It spread to North America and then to Europe in the 1840s. Now, another important thing to note is that only one mating type traveled. To get the sexual spores in Phytophthora infestans, you need two mating types, but only one mating type got to Europe. Okay, well, I mean, you know what happened next, the Great Irish Famine. It reduced the population of Irish people by 20 to 25 percent. Approximately a million people died and a million more emigrated. It is one of the biggest disasters in human history, but it could have been worse. If the second mating type had been present, those sexual spores could have persisted more and would have caused more damage. But 
And in the 80s, the second mating type did get to Europe, but by then they had fungicides and they had bred resistant potato cultivars. Okay, <coughs> let's talk about downy mildews. You can see why they're called downy mildews. Here is this down on the underside of a leaf. But this is only the part that you see. Inside this plant tissue, uh, it's completely uh, infested by the pathogen. Here is a cross section through a plant stem. You can see this little strand of the pathogen growing, oops, growing in between plant cells and traveling up the stem, up the petiole, into the leaves. Along the way, it produces these little blebs. These things are called hostoria and they penetrate into living plant cells and extract nutrients. The plant cell has to be alive. This is a parasite. Now this is a shot through the top surface of a leaf showing you uh, the mesophyll underneath and these sort of grainy blobs. If we focus down, this is the downy mildew infecting that plant leaf. And each of these lobes is seeking out a stomate on the underside of the leaf. Those lobes will push out of the stomate, extend, branch, and then form these sporangia, which will detach and spread in the wind to another plant. Meanwhile, back in the leaf, um, the oospores will develop. And in this particular pathogen that I'm showing, uh, only one mating type is needed for oospores to form. The leaf will die, fall to the ground. These things will overwinter in the litter layer of your garden. And in the spring, these will germinate and infect new, plant, new plants. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about a downy mildew. This is downy mildew of grape. So this is a long story. Um, of how America ruined French wine. First, somebody brought American grapevines to France and hitching a ride on those grapevines was this Phylloxera aphid. Now on American grape species, Phylloxera attacks leaves and you can see these funny growths on the leaf. In fact, you can probably go out this summer and see this. I see this in my yard. Um, but that's all it does. It attacks the leaves. However, on uh, wine grapes in Europe, the aphids can attack the roots, inject a toxin, and kill the grape plant. And this was devastating. From the 1850s to the 1870s, over 40% of French vineyards were destroyed. However, some clever French people figured out that you could graft European wine grapes onto American rootstock. The rootstock is resistant, so the plants survive and the wine industry was saved, they thought. However, this rootstock that seemed like it was the best thing ever brought a new pathogen to Europe, the downy mildew of grape. It causes very little damage to American grape species, but is severe on European wine grapes. So it was first observed in 1878 as the wine industry was recovering. And by 1882, it was in every wine growing region in France. So things look bad again. However, this guy, Pierre Miardet, was walking along a big,
vineyard and noticed that downy mildew was less severe on grapevines at the end of the rows as opposed to in the centers of the row. And he talked to a greenhouse manager and he said, you know, what's the deal? And the greenhouse managers or the, the vineyard manager said that they sprayed the ends of the rows with this bad tasting white powder to keep people from stealing the grapes. So just coincidentally, it also inhibited downy mildew. And so this mixture was called Bordeaux mix and it was the first fungicide. And because it's an inorganic fungicide, it still works today as well as it worked back then. And it is still used. So now let's talk about blue mold of tobacco. This, this was first, this first became a problem when it moved off wild tobacco in Australia to cultivated tobacco and began to damage their industry. In 1906, the same thing happened in the US. It spread off wild tobacco to cultivated tobacco in Texas. Now for the next few decades, there were outbreaks in seed beds. I don't know if you know how tobacco is, is grown, but the little seedlings are grown in a seed bed and then they're transplanted out into the field, the tobacco field. So it was found in seed beds. Then in 1957, it was introduced to Cuba, probably by the wind coming from Florida. Um, however, the Cubans have always said that the CIA brought it to Cuba and released it to destroy the cigar industry. And they believe that. Um, <clears throat> In 1959, there was a gigantic epidemic in Europe that was probably caused when scientists in the Netherlands were trying to study this pathogen and it got loose. In 1979, there was an epidemic not in seedbeds in the United States, but in fields, and it probably started from Cuba. So if the CIA did introduce it to Cuba, it backfired big time. In 1980, the losses in Cuba to tobacco were so huge that there was massive unemployment. And this probably triggered the, um, the movement of refugees to the US in the Mariel boat lift. So, you know, the, the the world of downy mildews and our world is just linked. So as I've said, it spreads in the wind. Plants that overwinter in southern regions produce spores and the spores are blown northward as spring progresses. Spores have been found over two kilometers above the earth and they can be blown hundreds of kilometers. A 500 hectare field of tobacco can produce six times 10 to the 13 spores every day. So, I mean, that's a lot, but this is still kind of amazing that plants say here down in the, in the Mediterranean produce enough spores that those spores will land on a tobacco field somewhere here, they'll get infected, they'll produce spores that will go here and so on. And if the weather is right, cause a huge epidemic. Well, so how do you control blue mold? You can spray your plants with pesticides, but that's expensive and of course bad for the environment. Instead of buying transplants from someone else and maybe bringing the disease into your field, you can grow your own transplants. You can place seed beds in locations with good sunlight because these spores are very, very sensitive to ultraviolet. Um, good drainage and good air circulation. You can 
get rid of debris that might be carrying the pathogen. And since 1980, there's been a blue mold warning service that maps spread. And I don't know, that used to maybe be on pigeons or something, but it is on the internet now. And you can plant resistant cultivars of tobacco. All right, but let's talk about the downy mildew that I study, which is the impatience downy mildew. So the host, the bedding impatience, which you've never thought about before, um, was originally from Africa. It was accidentally introduced to Costa Rica where it spread like a weed. Although the person who took this picture obviously didn't know that because it looks very, very pretty here by the waterfall. During World War II, um, a man who worked for the USDA, uh, Claude Hope, was drafted into the army and was supposed to build quinine plantations to uh, help protect soldiers from malaria. This was a giant failure um, but while he was in Costa Rica, he was quite entranced by this plant. And after the war, he came back to Costa Rica and started the Pan American Seed Company in 1953. This is now the Ball Seed Company. So bedding impatiens <clears throat> quickly became the primary bedding plant in the United States. And this is because it can grow in shade. It's low maintenance. It didn't used to have any major diseases and it had a long blooming season. And people just fell in love with it. Your grandmother fell in love with it. Um, you've seen it everywhere. What about the pathogen? Now, interestingly, this is a native pathogen to the United States. And in the 1880s, it was this downy mildew was reported on native jewelweeds, which if you've walked in the woods, you're familiar with jewelweed. Um, Impatience capensis and in Europe, Impatience noli tangere. However, in 1969, when bedding Impatience was introduced to the US market, there were no diseases. Those plants were just fine. In 2003, growers in the UK started to report problems with downy mildew. From 2004 to 2009, there were occasional greenhouse outbreaks in the US, but it was only in 2009 that the first landscape outbreak was reported in New York State. And in 2011 and 2012, there was widespread death of impatience in New York and Florida. So this is a, fam this is a famous picture taken by Marge Daughtry from Cornell University. This is a um, bed of impatience in September of 2011. Here's the same bed in October and the plants have been completely destroyed. Starting from Florida and New York, impatience downy mildew has spread through most of the United States and a lot of Canada, wherever, wherever bedding impatience is grown and is present in greenhouses. So this plant went from being valued at $130 million annually in, in 2007 to $70 million, a 47% decrease because of this disease. And you probably remember this. You probably remember people not growing in patients anymore and putting in this lookalike vinca instead. And you might have seen little notices in your favorite nursery warning you about impatience downy mildew. So the best way to understand a pathogen is to understand its life cycle. 
how does impatience downy mildew spread? Is it the wind? Is it seeds? Is it soil? What part do the oospores play in the life cycle? Is the pathogen systemic in the plant? And why did this begin in 2011 if the pathogen was here in 1880? Well, this is a very, downy mildews are really hard to work with because they're obligate pathogens. And you don't yourself want to spread it around and you want to keep your test material clean. So what I do is I detach leaves. I surface sterilize them in bleach, rinse them off, put them in Petri dishes on moist filter paper, and then I seal the Petri dishes. Then I get downy mildew spores <coughs> in water suspension. I drop that water on one of these nice clean leaves in the Petri dish. And then it, like six to 10 days later, I get the downy mildew coming out of the underside of the leaf. These leaves can live about two to three weeks, and then I have to do this, the whole thing again if I want to keep my cultures going. So there's a reason why very few people work with this organism. If you know impatience balsamina, um, which is also called touch me not, because if you touch the pods, they will burst open and spread seeds all around. Um, this plant, this species also gets infected with downy mildew. And if you take an infected pod and clear it and observe it here under the dissecting scope, if you see those little speckles, each of those is an oospore. So this diseased pod has got thousands and thousands of oospores. And if you look at seeds, in those infected pods. You can see here this characteristic mycelium with these little hostoria penetrating into plant cells and the beginning of O spores being formed. So it's possible that it can spread in seed. This, is not, <clears throat> this has been reported in India, but not in the United States. So it's not clear if that happens here. However, if you take these oospores and treat them to cold temperatures for a few months and then bring them up to a warmer temperature, they will germinate, form these sporangia, form zoospores, and the zoospores will swim away. So presumably in the soil, those zoospores are swimming and encountering roots of the new springtime crop of impatience. And in fact, these, this is impatience balsamina. Um, this plant, the roots were treated with just water. This plant, the roots were treated with sporangia of impatience downy mildew. And it spread from the roots to the stem, to the petioles, to the leaves, stunting and discoloring the plant. And this plant will eventually sporulate and release spores. So this is probably what happens in the spring. So a colleague of mine at USDA Beltsville has studied the genetics, the population uh, dynamics of this epidemic. And this is amazing work. She took preserved herbarium specimens of diseased plants, extracted the DNA from the downy mildew, and extracted DNA from samples from all of these different epidemics that occurred later and analyzed. And what she found out was from 1880 until 2003, you had this population mostly. When the epidemic began to take off, you got totally different populations uh, occurring. 
Now, either a new population suddenly appeared at this point, or the pathogen mutated at that point. But the difference was so striking that this historic population is called Plasmopora obducens. And this post-epidemic population was, was, decide, was termed a new species, Plasmopora destructor. And that's what we've got now. All right, well, here at the lab, we had a citizen science project that we did beginning in 2017. And unfortunately now interrupted, of course, by the pandemic. But we go to the Frederick Fort Detrick um, Spring Science Festival and Fort Detrick has a take your child to week day uh, or, or take your child to work day um, where everybody's children come and talk to scientists. And we would hand out two plants to each child, a red impatience and a white impatience. And we would tell the child to plant this in their yard, watch it and send in this postcard when they saw the downy mildew. And we had, you know, email address, Twitter, Facebook. And um, what we didn't tell the children is that the white ones were susceptible, that's bedding in patients. And the red ones were immune, those were New Guinea in patients, which maybe get a little downy mildew sometimes, but mostly don't. So that was our little secret experiment to see if people were paying attention. So this was our 2017 reports. And you see that we get a lot of reports in Maryland, but there clearly were people who were from other places who took their impatients home and planted them. So we got a pretty wide distribution of where the pathogen was that year. A few people reported getting downy mildew on plants that were like in their kitchen windowsill. And I think they were just imagining it, but mostly I think this data was pretty good. So that's all I have to say about downy mildews. I've been part of a project to redescribe all the downy mildews found on grasses in the world. And I was asked to draw pictures of them. And this is harder than you might think because some of these organisms have never been seen after they were first described. So I had to go on what the publications said. And I really couldn't go by the written descriptions. I had to go by either figures or photographs. So for instance, here's something I had to work with for this downy mildew. So my illustrations are kind of only as good as what I was given. However, I was able to standardize the drawings and importantly, draw them all at the same scale so that somebody seeing these things would know what size they were. And it has been quite rewarding to do. Anyway, that's the end of my talk. And if anyone has questions, go ahead and ask. Nina, that was wonderful. Let me, um, we all, okay, we're coming back together. And let me just put a spotlight on you. Do we have any questions for Nina on this fascinating uh, glimpse into a part of uh, our natural world that uh, many people um, might not be familiar with, but are familiar with because it has, it has impacted uh, humankind uh, in such a dramatic way. Um, is, is there anything good about downy mildews? Um, let's think. Like, like, for instance, it, are there <laughs> pharmacological benefits like, uh, like you know, moldy, moldy bread gave us penicillin. Oh, 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 oh. Um, 
not, I don't know if you've ever heard of powdery mildew, um, but grapes that have been diseased late in the season in Europe and Canada, um, they, if they're diseased but not too diseased, the grapes dehydrate and they become sweeter. And you have something called late harvest wine ah. that is a you know delicacy. And that is because of disease on the wine, on the grapes. But I can't really think of anything else good. Well, um, Janet had a question earlier on. Does the blue mold attack ornamental tobacco that is grown for the flowers, like uh, Nicotiana alata, for example? Probably. I would have to look at the host range, but most things in Nicotiana will get it. Nicotiana, okay. Is powdery mildew the same as downy mildew? No, they are different. Powdery mildews are true fungi and they are completely superficial. What you see there is what you get. Whereas downy mildews are systemic in the plant. Um, Chris asks, is there a way to eliminate downy mildew from a vegetable garden? Well, this is what I have to talk to to people who have impatience plants. They want to know, can they grow impatience? And there's kind of two answers. One is, if you've never seen downy mildew in your yard, um, you have the luck of the wind. If the wind doesn't blow it in, you're fine. Now, if the wind blows it in, you will get those oospores and those will persist in the soil. So you can plant something else or you can plant New Guinea impatiens, um, but then you have to wait a while so that those oospores die instead of infecting a new batch of impatiens. So they're very, very hard to control without fungicides. Okay, um, Chris, oh no, that was already it. Jack says, asks, what is the genetic material of downy mildew? How many chromosomes, et cetera? Can genes be introduced to reduce virulence? Man, Jack, come and work here for me. Um, um, it is just in the last, I don't know, five years that people have been able to do genetic analysis of downy mildews because they are obligate parasites. It is really hard to get enough spores to do the genetic analysis. Now people are getting better of getting DNA out of mixed tissue so they can get the downy mildew part out of the plant part. And so we are at the dawn of being able to understand the genetics of downy mildews. And I don't, I don't know how many chromosomes, but I think it varies from genus to genus. And there are, you know, like 10 or 12 different genera. Um, I had a question myself. I, I found it fascinating that your colleague was going back into preserved herbarium. Um, is that something that is is ongoing? Is she working in with different uh, uh, species? I mean, how we have it? We have preserved species as well um, from the 1800s. Would 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 downy mildew be on some of our um, specimens? Well, she works at Beltsville, which has the mycological herbarium. So she is specifically looking at plants that were known to be diseased when they were collected. But still, it's an amazing achievement to get DNA out of things from 1881. It is. Fred asks, does the pathogen that kills chestnuts also attack multiple other trees? 
um, Leland cypress are dying off in my yard, and I heard this was the same fungus. Well, it's I don't know what's I don't know what that would be. It's not. It could be a Phytophthora. Certainly, that's what they do. Um, but I don't know that it's Phytophthora cinnamomi, which is what took out the chestnuts. However, in California, it's attacking hundreds of hosts. The vegetation in California, you know, has never seen it before, and many of the plants are susceptible. So it's a big problem now. So the cinnamona that came from uh, that that devastated New Zealand, um, that was the same one that that was transported to the United States. Uh, yes, but saying New Zealand reminds me to say an amazing thing, which is it's Australia where it caused all this damage. It is also found in New Zealand where it causes practically no damage. And the difference is the soil. Uh, New Zealand soils are much more well draining, so you don't have the conditions that cause the disease. So that's really kind of amazing. Thank you for that clarification. Also, uh, are, there, are there implications with climate change in terms of the distribution of these um, uh, organisms? Oh, yes. Uh, talking about Phytophthora cinnamomai, that was um, a southern species. And it was not found above the Mason-Dixon line when people started studying it. But now because of climate change, it is being moved northward. So yeah, it, it will be a bigger problem farther north than it had been. Um, for downing, other downing, for downing mildews, I, there must be, I don't know, there must be a place up north where people don't grow impatiens that are growing them now. But I imagine it can travel farther north now. Also, the, um, the O spores, they need a cold period in order to germinate, but if it's too cold, they'll die. So that also will change with climate change. Uh, Jillian asks, is there any interaction between endophytes fungi within the plant tissue and parasitic water mold? Is there competition? Ooh, that's a very good question. And people are just starting to look at that. It's possible, but we don't know yet. And then Bill asks, does anything eat or prey on downy mildews? Some insects will eat it. So was um, in Australia before the roads were going in and the, uh, the problem took hold, things were more just in equilibrium. I mean, there was downy mildew. They, the, I mean, the mildew, it existed. It just wasn't causing wreaking havoc. Wait. Uh, Downy mildews where? Was it Australia? Okay, well, that's that's a um, that's a phytophthora. Oh, and, a phytophthora. And without road building, it spreads very very close slowly. I read an article a few weeks ago about how Phytophthora cinnamomi probably dates back to Gondwana land, and it was then probably in New Guinea and might have spread with the first, the earliest humans coming to Australia. And that's all extremely speculative. But those original settlers were not building roads. So it was spreading very, very slowly, you know, maybe feet a year. Gotcha. Paige asks, going off of Jillian's question, is there a way to eliminate downy mildews with bacteria or something like that? Not practically. Really, if you want to deal with downy mildews, you have to breed a resistant plant. And 
Ball Seed Company has been making hybrids between New Guinea in patients and bedding in patients to try to come up with resistant plants. And in the end, that is going to be the solution. Where are your illustrations being um, published of the... Of, of... Oh, I don't know. Um, I would have to ask my co-authors where they where they're they're about to to send it to a a journal so it will be in some journal somewhere but i don't know that's really i mean it's it's really amazing uh uh work to be able to recreate it's almost a forensic uh, uh artistry going back and putting those pieces together well it's it's more than just making something pretty. You have to you're 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 trying to convey information. So for instance, if you notice the gray areas that were modeled, the modeling means that cytoplasm. A solid line means it's a wall. Um, the vacuoles are denoted by a dotted line. So it's not realistic but it's just trying to uniformly convey information to somebody who wants to know which one they have. So it's, it's a different way of drawing a plant or a fungus or a chromist. Is there, um, is there any, are there any plans to um, do the citizen or community science project again, or is there data that that could be collected? Do you want people to be looking for downy mildew at their homes and sending you information? I wish I knew when this pandemic would end, as we all would. When it ends and when we can do this again, we will. Um, it's the, the nice thing about downy mildew is people can recognize it once they're given a reference. So people could really report to us where it is. And some years it's everywhere and some years it's nowhere. So it, it's useful information. Fred says that copper sulfate is toxic to aquatic organisms. Is this still widely used as a control? No. I mean, not only is it toxic to organisms, it is toxic to lots of things. So particularly edible things, you have to use it very carefully. So no, it's not used very much, but it still works because, and when you need it, it is there. All right. Any other questions? You can put them in the chat box. You can raise your hand uh, and unmute and we'll give you the floor if you'd like. Bill says, uh, might another solution to the blight be genetically modifying the susceptible impatient plant? Yes. And I know there are researchers doing that. It's just a matter of people not being afraid of genetically modified impatients, which I don't, since people aren't eating it, there's really no reason to worry one tiny bit. We're all genetically modified organisms in some way or form. Um, all right. Any other questions for uh, Dr. Shishkov this evening? If not, on behalf of the Natural History Society of Maryland, thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge, uh, your expertise, and your passion about this, pro um, this subject matter to us. We have all been illuminated, um, and we are all smarter for it. Now, everybody has to take this information and share it with other people so that we continue to make the world a smarter place. Um, and I hope that we can find a way to, for Nina to come back and give us some more information on some other topics um, uh, sometime. <laughs> 
and again, I hope to see everybody uh, at our upcoming Must Learn Thursdays and other programs and field trips um, that are uh, that you can find out about for, uh, on our online um, and through the social media platforms. Everybody, please stay well, um, stay curious, and uh, we will see you soon. Thank you.